nations in his hands, who has numbered every grain of sand. Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore This morning, we have come to adore, worship, and honor you. You are the awesome and mighty God. And often, the evidence that we see in our own lives and around us can sometimes cause us to question, but we recognize through creation the beauty of the changing of the leaves and the cool crisp of the air that you are still in control, that you are God, and we are here to praise and worship you this morning. We lift up all of those this morning who are struggling, who are hurting, and ask that your grace would be given to them in tremendous measure. For those of us who are um, riding a high these days, we praise you for the blessings that we enjoy. We pray that we would be able to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice and together be a family of people 
who love and serve you and care for each other. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, welcome. Good morning. Uh, if you're a, a guest here at Twickenham, we are glad that you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. I want to mention this to you real quickly early now. There's a card on the seat in front of you. Uh, you can fill that out and um, put that in the collection plate when it passes in just a moment. We're going to do that very soon. Um, if you have a prayer request, indicate that on the card, and we'll be praying about those things first thing tomorrow morning. So I just wanted to get that out there so you can get started on those cards because the collection plate's going to pass really, really quickly. Hey, I missed you last week. Um, uh, my, my friend, uh, Ken, told me, he, he, we talked to him like on Monday or Tuesday, he had awesome things to say about you guys. Thank you for receiving him so graciously. Um, and I'm, I appreciate my, my colleagues on staff and the elders for giving me a week away to go do some reading and thinking and praying. And uh, I've missed a lot of you. I've missed a lot of you. So, good to be back. Good to be back. Hey, w w um, tonight at, uh, what time is our thing tonight? Five o'clock, we're going to have our annual trunk or treat, and I really want to encourage you to come be a part of that. If you don't, if you haven't, if, you know, you, you don't have that creative gift, and you don't really know how to decorate up your car, or your truck, or your SUV, don't worry about it. Just park it up here, raise the lid. Uh, and put down the tailgate and just sit there on the tailgate in the back of your car, your truck, your SUV, and just hand out candy to kids that come and, and uh, tr trunk or treat here. It's a big deal. We have people from all over our community come and be a part of this. Love for you to be a part of that. We actually need for you to be a part of that. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, that's the thing that we do for kids. And then uh, we have our, our Twickenham Children's Ministry, which is so active and does so many great things. And then we have our Twickenham Youth Ministry. And uh, if you're not following TYM on Instagram, you should do that. That's kind of cool to see what's going on with our, with, our, with our young people, our teenagers. And then I thought, well, you know, we also do Hacienda for Hope down in Ecuador. That's a children's home that we support. In fact, that's our foreign mission work. That's the one that we do, the only one that we do, because we believe so deeply in it, and we go down there all the time. And then I thought about Huntsville Inner City Learning Center, and I thought, you know, a lot of what we do here at Twickenham is focused on our kids. So when you, when you give on Sunday mornings, that's not just, you, you know, going nowhere, that's a, a lot of what you give every week goes toward ministering to children, telling them the story of Jesus, or taking care of their physical needs or emotional needs. So I just wanted you to know that. Um, we're a little bit behind on our giving this year, not way behind, not so far behind that I feel like I need to give you a giving sermon, but I will if I need to, okay? But toward the end of the year, as you think about your year-end giving, it'd be a great time for you to kind of help us catch up. We're about a week and a half behind, which is actually pretty good, but it'd be even awesomer to be a week and a half ahead. That'd be really better. So, hey, we're going to, uh, you know how at this part of the service we always usually say, Let, let's all stand and sing, stand and sing? Stay seated, okay? We're not going to stand right now. We will in a minute, but we're going to take up our collection right now while we sing this next song, and then somewhere in the middle of it, then we'll stand. But glad you're here this morning. Let's sing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall be. is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watching unto or danger be never wanting let's stand stand up stand up for Jesus the strife will not be long this day the noise of battle the next the victor song to him that overcometh a shall be he with the king of glory shall reign eternal
just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us, kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes our hearts can say. Jesus. 
Jesus, only Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. Amen. Would you remain standing as we read from 1 Peter? But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends. I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the life. You are the fight within my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. I will sing into the night. Christ is risen and on high. Greater is he living in me than in the world. No surrender, no retreat. We are free and we're over despair, you are the whole. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Nothing is impossible, every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious, you are stronger than our hearts, you are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious, in one voice, we are more than conquerors. to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Our Lord, our God, our conqueror. And be seated, please. Amen. Hey, next week we're going to start a new series. Um, we're finishing up this morning the uh, series that we've been doing on Daniel, chapter six, or chapters one through six, and we're in chapter six this morning if you want to turn over there. Next week we're going to begin a series called The Problem. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? Uh, we'll be dealing with, um, it, it's a pretty old question that uh, philosophers have called the problem of evil. If, there's, if God is all good and all knowing and all powerful, then how do you explain the, the existence of pain and suffering in the world? So it's a, I think it's a question that a lot of us wrestle with. I know that it's a question that a lot of people who are skeptical of faith wrestle with. And so if you 
have a friend or a coworker or a family member that that's what has has asked that question and wondered with you about it, this would be a great series to bring them to, uh, just to invite them to come be a part of that. A lot of times, people will come to something like that if we invite them. So I, I want to just urge you to kind of step out on faith a little bit, take a risk, and invite somebody to come join you. Um, I can't tell you that that we'll we'll get all the answers we're looking for, okay? But we're all, we're we're going to deal with that question is as honestly and authentically as we can. It starts next week, the problem. If, God, if, the world, if God's so good, why is the world so bad? And, and as I said, we're in, in Daniel chapter 6 this morning. So if you want to uh, open your Bibles kind of the middle of Psalms and then turn to the left, you'll, you'll eventually run into Daniel sometime after Ezekiel. So, hey, reading, when you read the news these days, you would think that we have reached the pinnacle of political hatred and, and rivalry and bitterness. It just seems like everybody is mad about something and that it's getting worse and worse and worse. But, but the truth is, not so long ago, things were, things were pretty tense. Some of you are old enough to remember when, when Robert Kennedy was the Attorney General and, and Lyndon Johnson was the, was the President. Uh, though they were members of the same party, they, they couldn't stand each other. I mean, the rivalry was so intense that Kennedy's aides actually gave him a Johnson voodoo doll. That, and he would stick it with needles every time Johnson said or did something that irritated him, which was every time. And Johnson called Kennedy a grandstanding little runt on the, on the record. <laughs> So they, they kind of made the Trump, Hillary, Bernie thing, you know, seem tameish. But you go a little further back in history, and it gets even worse. Uh, there was a feud between founding father Alexander Hamilton and Vice President Aaron Burr that was literal. It was a literal feud. After years of bitter back and forth, Burr challenged Hamilton to a duel, the old-fashioned kind with live ammo, and Burr won. So we had, we had a sitting vice president who had personally dispatched somebody. And then, of course, the deeper into history you go, the worse it gets. Um, Nero took the Roman throne when he was 16 years old. Can you guys imagine that? Like ruling? Uh, you can't imagine that. I'm not surprised. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So Nero takes the throne at 16, and four months later, four months after his inauguration, he invited his half-brother over. Back in those days, family members often posed the greatest threat to your authority. So Nero invited his half-brother over to kind of develop a relationship, and he poisoned him. Nero poisoned his half-brother. And then his mother also posed a threat to his throne, so he tried twice to orchestrate her accidental death and then when those two times failed he just dispensed with all the pretense and just had her assassinated so it it's it's always been bad and sometimes it's been even worse that's the kind of climate that exists when we get to Daniel chapter 6 um, that, that politics is a nasty business and it gets pretty nasty here in this chapter. So we, what, what I want to do with you is just kind of walk through the story. It's a great story. We'll just sort of walk through it, and then I'll give you two or three takeaways for us to think about what it can mean for us. So Darius is the new king in Babylon, uh, installed there by Cyrus. And he decided that it would be a great idea if he decentralized the government. So he appointed 120 satraps, or provincial, uh, provincial governors, to manage things out in the territories. And then he was going to appoint three administrators to manage the provincial governors, which kind of makes sense, right? I mean, it's a lot easier to meet with three people than it is to meet with 120 people, uh, especially if one of the three is Daniel. Nobody in the kingdom has more experience at this point in the story than Daniel. By the time we get to chapter 6, 
He has served three different administrations, and he's well into his 70s, if not older. And he's got a reputation for being absolutely incorruptible, honest, and efficient. So it's no wonder then that Darius decides to make Daniel the chief administrator because if it's easy to meet with three, it's even easier to meet with one, right? So Daniel is going to be in charge of the other two administrators who are in charge of the 120 provincial governors. But now here's another example of how politics has not changed a bit. An unnamed source in Darius' government, Darius' administration, told the press that Daniel was going to be appointed the number one administrator. And that leaked out. And it was published in the Babylonian Times. And the other two administrators and the 120 satraps did not like that one little bit. So here's, the, here's what it says in Daniel chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Here's how the story goes. At this, this news that leaked out, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Okay, so maybe government has changed a little bit since back then, okay? Verse 5, finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with his God. Wouldn't it be cool if people could say that about you and me? Like, we'll never find anything against, bad against him or her unless we somehow find a way to make what they do in their faith against the law. So since they can't find any fault with David, they decide to try entrapment. And there's, all, you know, there's always a group of people like this. I don't care, it, it, in real life, in, in your, in, at work, in the movies, there's always some nefarious group of people, that, you know, the Decepticons of any situation like that that are out there to undermine the good guys, right? So they, they decide to try and trap, but verse 6 says that they went as a group to meet with Darius. That phrase, they went as a group, I, went, I was rereading this passage over the last couple of weeks, and I noticed that that phrase comes up three times. I'd never noticed that before. They went as a group, they went as a group, they went as a group. That, in other words, this is a conspiracy. Everything they're doing here is a conspiracy to undermine Daniel. And so they go to Darius and they say, hey, you know what would be cool? If we made you God of the month, like deity of the month, you could be God for the next 30 days. You'd get a parking place and we'd get you a hat. And then when anybody prays, they pray to you. And you think about this, Darius, it would be awesome because you got 120 provinces spread out there and we're all rooting for different football teams and so if we're all praying to you it brings unity to the empire yeah that's it unity to the empire and glory to you so what do you say and Darius loved the idea so he signs an executive order making himself God for the next 30 days now you may find it hard to believe that a political leader would seriously welcome deification by his followers and I will not argue with you. I'm just going to point out that the current and most recent previous presidents both seem to kind of lean in that direction, all right? Okay, that didn't get a laugh like I thought it would. So. <laughs> Don't do politics, right? Don't do politics. But I was getting everybody. At any rate, the order was signed, and the 30-day deity of Darius became law of the land, and that presented a problem to Daniel. Because back in chapter 3, remember this story? Three of his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were told, you better bow down and worship this idol. Now, Daniel is being told, you better not worship your God in prayer. So what does Daniel do? Now look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, now Daniel, when Daniel learned the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. 
Why pray toward Jerusalem? It's not commanded anywhere in the Bible to do that, but when Solomon dedicated the temple back in 1 Kings chapter 8, he asked God to hear the prayers of his scattered people whenever they prayed toward Jerusalem. I think Daniel's sort of leaning on that a little bit. So it's really interesting. The temple is in ruins back in Jerusalem because Nebuchadnezzar, 70 years earlier, had sacked it. Jerusalem looks like a deconstructed Lego set. Daniel is spending his seventh decade in exile, 70 years he's been away from home. It is illegal to pray to anybody but Darius, but Daniel prays anyway. This is This is what we're going to be talking about next week and in the weeks that follow. What do you do? How do you process it? When all of the evidence seems to say God is not in control, what do you do with that? Well, all of the the evidence that Daniel could see said that God was not in control, but he prayed anyway, just, just as he had done before which is really all the conspirators needed because they catch Daniel in the very act and they run to report to the king. It's interesting when they, when they go tell, tell on Daniel to Darius, they call him the exile. The exile pays no attention to you, King Darius. Daniel has been there for 70 years and he's still not one of the guys. He's still not included. Some of y'all know kind of what that feels like. Darius, though, is really fond of Daniel. And so, according to verse 14, he he was greatly distressed, and he tried every legal maneuver he could think of to save Daniel, but Medo-Persian policy stated that once a king signed an executive order, it could not be rescinded, so Darius was forced to order the execution of Daniel, his trusted friend and advisor. Daniel was thrown into a den of lions. The opening was covered over with a stone, and the stone was fixed with the king's own seal. Verse 18 says that Darius spent that night without food, without sleep, without entertainment. So I want to pick up the story in verse 19, okay, and just finish it out here in in this passage. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, Has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. May God, my God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done any wrong before you, your majesty. Verse 23 says, The king was overjoyed. He was flabbergasted that God had saved Daniel. Now the next part of the story is probably not included in any of the children's Bible story books that we use in Sunday school or that you have on your shelves at home. Let's just say that the conspirators and their families suffered the fate they had planned for Daniel. It's not wise to mess with Medo-Persian kings. The last thing we learn in chapter 6 We're going to come back to this. Is that Darius issued a decree ordering the people of the kingdom to fear and reverence Daniel's God. He he made it a law to fear and reverence Daniel's God. It's a good place for us to stop and and think about some some takeaways for us, some applications for us. First of all, let let me give you, I think there are three of them here. There's a message here to God's people In this story, there is a message to God's people who are living in a culture that is unwelcoming to our faith. It it is really good for us to remember that there has never been a culture that comfortably welcomed the kingdom of God. Never. Taken as a whole, most of the historical context of the Bible is the story of people who are outside the cultural orthodoxy. They were, they were considered cultural outlaws. And in, and in every era, you, you, you can look back at any point in American history, any point in European history, there are ways in which the, the, the authentic Christian faith is absolutely counter 
to the prevailing culture. So in, in, in different ways and different times, there are places where the culture and Christianity kind of mesh and agree, but in every situation, there are major areas of disagreement between the culture and the faith. So sometimes, like here in Daniel, sometimes things are just uncomfortable. Sometimes, like here in Daniel, standing by your principles is a life or death decision. Either way, God's people have almost always been in the minority. Many of the prophets and all of the apostles were severely persecuted for their faith. And there are places in the world right now where Christians are facing precisely those kinds of pressures to preach, to teach, to pray, to worship, just to believe in the name of Jesus. In some places in our world, this very minute is a death sentence for Christians. Now here in the States, we we don't face anything that even approaches that kind of persecution, which should give us some perspective, and that perspective should make us grateful. Still, it is obvious that even in in the United States, even in the West, the Christian faith faces more pushback and less respect than ever. We no longer, remember in Acts when it says, and they enjoyed the favor of all the people, we don't get that anymore. Daniel offers a lesson on how to, how to deal with that, how to face that loss of favor. As you look through these six chapters, you, you've seen Daniel and his three friends pressured to comply with Babylonian customs that were contrary to their faith. They were, they were uh, pressured to comply with Babylonian dietary norms. They were ordered to bow down to Babylon, Babylonian idols, or they were forbidden to worship their own God in prayer. Here's what we have not seen them do, and I think this is important. We have not seen Daniel or his friends mount a protest, rally the troops, start a boycott, send around a petition. We have not seen them arm themselves for violent response. They never fight for their faith by killing other people. But they are always prepared to die. Now, that doesn't sound very American, but it is very biblical. In fact, that's exactly, precisely what Jesus did. Jesus told Pilate, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. His kingdom is not of this world. Listen to me. We we don't, churches don't denounce this kind of thing often enough. Anybody, anywhere who claims allegiance to Jesus and kills other people in the name of Jesus is not even close to Jesus. Nowhere close. Violence is never justified in the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Regard, now, let me go a little another step here. Regardless of your politics, whether you lean left or right, and I, we've got, you know, this is a pretty diverse church politically, so we've got people that go either way. Whether you lean left or right, there are Christians in your group, maybe not you, but there are Christians in your group, whether you lean left or to the right, who would love nothing more than to elect leaders who would do exactly what Darius did at the end of Daniel chapter 6, pass laws that enforce whatever kingdom values your group champions. Maybe you don't think that, maybe you don't believe that, but there are people in your group, whether you, either way, both sides, who would love for the government to pass laws that require people to embrace kingdom values, to legislate kingdom values, which on the surface might seem like a real big win for the kingdom. You know, awesome, but not really. You, you cannot compel people to honor God by legal mandate. You you may gain their compliance, but you will not have their hearts. And history shows that when the church looks to government for its support or attempts to use the government to mandate kingdom values, the church becomes weak at best or corrupt at worst. Henry Nouwen, in a book called In the Name of Jesus, wrote about how Christians are tempted to use power to achieve the goals of the kingdom. He, 
He asks, what makes the temptation to power so seemingly irresistible? Maybe he answers, it is that power offers an easy substitute for the hard task of love. It seems easier to be God than to love God, easier to control people than to love people. So there's a word here, a message here, about how we live in a culture that pushes back against our faith. And, and the first response is, we, we don't use power, we don't use government to fight against it. So what do we do? Well, there's a message here about how important it is and difficult it is to stand by your convictions when those convictions are not widely embraced. And again, that's not a new thing. That's not the only, this is, Daniel is not the only time that ever happens in the Bible. In Acts chapter 5, when the apostles were told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, Peter famous, famously replied, we must obey God rather than men. In Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus, Jesus said, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's not always as easy as it sounds. You know, we sing, this little light of mine. That, it's a great little children's song, but it's kind of hard to do that at work or at school or in the neighborhood. And sometimes it's hard to do that in your own house. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, Peter said, and we read this a minute ago, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify our God on the day he visits us. You know, we, we, we kind of like that last part there. Oh, they're going to glorify God on the day he visits us. We forget the first part. They're going to accuse you of doing wrong. When you live your life by the standards of God, people in the culture, whatever culture, are going to accuse you of, of doing wrong. They're going to think it's wrong for you to do that. It is not always easy for us to stand by our convictions. I mean, how, how hard is it for you guys, to say yes to something good and something from God when everybody else in your group at school is saying no to it. I mean, that's hard. How hard is it for you to practice integrity when your business colleagues or competitors excel through dishonesty? That's hard. How hard is it to maintain your morals when everybody around you celebrates their conquests, that's a challenge. How hard is it to pray when your faith feels completely unrewarded, your prayers seem to go unanswered, and your struggles appear to be unending? That's hard. Not all lions are faced in pits. You face them at school, you face them at home, in the neighborhood, at work. That's why Peter said, be watchful, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, roars about, walks about like a lion, seeking whom you may devour. It's good for us to hear this old story. It's really, you know, we always kind of look at Daniel 6 as a children's story, but it's not, really. It's good for us to hear it as adults and as teenagers because it tells us the truth about living life God's way. It is not all cupcakes and roses. But at the same time, this story calls us to step up and be faithful. Now look, I, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I, I know, just size of the room, I know that somebody in this room right now is facing a situation where you're, you've got to make a decision about whether you're going to stand by your convictions as a Christian or you're going to cave in and do what everybody else is doing. Somebody in this room is facing that, that dilemma right now. And, and, and I want to say this story is talking to you. This story is, 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 is God's way of saying to you, stand up. Don't, don't give in. Don't give up. Don't go with the flow. Don't fold. Stand up. Stand by your principles. And the story is also telling you, look, it may not go well for you if you do that initially. You may be thrown into a, line, a, den, a, line of, a den of lions, but you've got to hang in there. That's what this story is calling. Let me, let me sh share another challenge here. In, in his commentary on Daniel, Sinclair Ferguson asked a really pointed question. He said, would it make a substantial difference in your life if prayer were banned 
for the next 30 days. You know, if, if, if somebody signed an order that said it is illegal to pray in Huntsville, Alabama, or Madison County for the next 30 days, would that make a difference to you? It's interesting that when, that when Daniel learned of the decree banning prayer, in verse 10, it says that he, he, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Just as he had done before. Prayer was his habit. It was his discipline. It wasn't his 911 call. It wasn't the fire alarm on the wall. It's what he did every day. It needs to be a part of our lives too. Okay, one more takeaway from this story. This is a story about a man who was falsely accused, who was arrested while praying in a private place. It's a story about a man who was brought before a pagan ruler who unsuccessfully attempted to save him from a death sentence. It's about a man who was handed over to a violent death, who was placed in the pit, covered with a stone, sealed with a royal imprint, but who was ultimately delivered alive from that ordeal. That's the story of Daniel, right? Yes. But it's also the story of Jesus. Jesus was falsely accused. Jesus was arrested while praying in a private place. Jesus was brought before a pagan ruler, Pilate, who unsuccessfully attempted to save him from a death sentence. Jesus was handed over to a violent death. He was placed in a tomb covered with a stone, sealed with a royal imprint, and he was ultimately delivered alive from that ordeal. With one huge difference between Jesus and Daniel. Jesus went, went much further than Daniel did. Daniel didn't die. Jesus went all the way through death and back. In the end, your deliverance and mine does not depend on how much like Daniel we are. It doesn't depend on how faithfully we stand by our convictions in an unfriendly culture. It doesn't even depend on how hard or much we pray. In the end, your deliverance and mine depends on whether we have put our confidence in what God did through Jesus on the cross. That's what saves us, not our cultural stand against the man, not our prayer lives, not how righteously we live. In the end, we are saved by what Jesus did on the cross. That's the message of Scripture. That's the message of the gospel. And that's the message we need to remember. Great to remember Daniel. Essential that we remember Jesus and his sacrifice. Hey, can I get you guys to come on back up? Oh, you're not coming up this time, or you are coming up this time? You're not coming up this time, okay. Um, we're about to take communion here, okay? We're about to have a, a, this is a ritual that we do every Sunday, our Lord's Supper. We take a little bit of bread, and it's a way of remembering the body of Jesus. Remembering that, that, that he was fully human, fully God, but fully human, and that he died on a cross for us. And then we take that, that, the cup, which is it's kind of a gruesome symbol. It's a symbol of his blood. It reminds us of the price that had to be paid to deliver us from the guilt and power of sin. It reminds us of how horrible sin is. It required that kind of sacrifice. And, and, and as we share this every week, it's just our way of remembering Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. If you're not a member here, we invite you to, to share this with us if you want to. If you, if you don't feel like that's a thing you want to do, just there'll, there'll be uh, some time here for you to reflect, listen to the song that we sing, reflect in silence. But this is a really important part of our service every week. We're going to sing a song, and then uh, Mike Patterson will lead us in the prayers for our, our bread. Or Mike's just going to come on up. Okay, come, Mark. Mark, come on up and lead us in our prayer for the bread and for the, the cup to follow. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide, where all the cross at the
cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in I owe all to you, I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless, where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. I surrender my life, I owe all to you, I owe all of you, where your love ran red, and my sin was white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, here my hope is found, here on holy surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin was white. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let's pray. Holy God, we come before you this morning in full assurance in knowing who you are, in recognition of our own sin and our place without you. We are thankful for the body of Jesus we're thankful for the sacrifice that was made, for the body that was nailed to the cross in our place. And for this, we take this bread in remembrance of that. In Jesus we pray. Amen.
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you just in awe of who you are. And we thank you for, at this time, for the blood of Jesus. The blood that was, uh, that ran down the cross. That formed a pool on the ground. uh, That should have been ours. But Father, you did it, your son did it in in our stead. And we're thankful. We're thankful for the blessings that we have through his blood. That we're reminded if we're in fellowship with you and with one another. That your son's blood continually washes us day after day. And it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all.
four things. Uh, first of all, I'm very sorry uh, to have to announce that Calvin McClure passed away on Friday. Calvin was a charter member. I have a document in my office of where the 80 or so original members signed a piece of paper to announce their intent to start a new church, and that is this church, and his name is right there on it, and so he has been here a long time. You might not know him if you didn't come in the front entrance, because that was his post back there, greeting people every Sunday, and so he will be greatly missed. Uh, the service for Cal Calvin is tomorrow, visitation here at 10, and the funeral service to follow at 11, so please make a note of that, and uh, keep the prayer, uh, keep the family in your prayers this week. Secondly, as Jody mentioned, uh, tonight is Trunk or Treat, always an exciting time, one of the biggest community events that we have around here. We encourage you, again, just get some candy and bring your car down, it's not hard. It's a nice thing to do, okay? So just come out and support that tonight at 5. We've got chili and all the good stuff. Secondly, also remember this week, Friday is our day of prayer, our th uh, service. It is from 12 until 12. Prayer cards are still available. You can get those and fill them out. And uh, take some time to come down and spend an hour or so with those cards on Friday from 12 to 12. Also, following that on Saturday is our Aging Well Ministry Fair. That's from 8 until noon. And that is to give information and some teaching on care for and how to deal with the aging people in our families. Or maybe it's you and you need to come and hear some stuff. So please, that'll be good stuff. Do that. And lastly, Jody, it's been a great series. Thank you very much. I'm very relieved um, to hear that story, especially that you told today, um, about JFK. Because Steve and I have voodoo dolls of you and, well... <laughs> They're full of pins, actually, from all the times that you frustrated us. So I just feel like I should confess that, and I appreciate you letting me off the hook on that one. Thanks a lot. Hey, we're glad that you were here, and let's close in prayer. We hope you have a great day and a great week. Would you bow with me? Father, thank you for another Lord's Day. It's, uh, it's been good to be here, Father, because even though it's cold and uh, dark outside, your Son and your Spirit are certainly in this place. We're so thankful and blessed to be a part of this congregation of your people here at Twickenham. We uh, pray that you would continue to smile on us as you have in the past. Bless our elders and staff as they lead us. Give them a special measure of wisdom and discretion as they make the decisions that uh, lead this church, Father. We're so thankful for the many blessings that are ours. Uh, help us to take the time each day, Father, to count our blessings and to, to know that every good thing we have is from you. We pray that you would be with us as we go from this place. Help us to be salt and light to the, those around us. Help us to conduct ourselves so that they can see you in our lives and see the hope that we have within us because of you, Father. We pray that you would guide and direct our steps, guard us from evil, and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.